Thank you, everybody, for joining us for another Steve and Troy show. So last time Steve wasn't here. I mean, I wasn't here. Troy wasn't here, but Steve was here. Steve has decided that going off and photographing Megadeth would be way more important than hanging out with us tonight. I gave him a pass. Uh, it was fair. I was on vacation before. So, um, And so with us tonight, we have uh, Lee Herbert, which is part of the Twit Pro community. And he is a cinematographer, videographer extraordinaire. Um, Lee... I, I looked up your website. I looked up all the amazing things you've done. And I thought, you know what? Nobody would better introduce yourself than you, right? I, I, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, you can go ahead and run the show. Um, thanks, Troy. Uh, lovely to be here. Thanks, thanks for giving me the time to have a chat. I think we'll, I think we'll have a lot of fun and learn, learn a fair bit. Um, very briefly, a little bit about me. Um, where do I start? Because that could take an hour in itself. I used to work um, in the technology field, so um, sort of working as, as a trainer in the technology field, and gradually I started filming a lot of things. I also worked in theatre, so I used to film things like that, and I started doing a lot of internal uh, production, like sort of corporate production at the, at the corporate company that I worked for, and I wanted to do more and more of it, and in the nicest possible way, they were like, well, if that's what you want to do full-time, that's not going to happen here. Go off and do it somewhere else. I was like, cool. Um, so I started my own production company back in 2014 and um, right up until the time when we weren't allowed to leave our houses anymore, things were going great. Um, things are still going all right, but it's, it's, been an, it's been a dynamic couple of years. I think we could all agree to that. Um, mostly what we do is corporate video. So think your typical kind of corporate talking heads, CEOs giving a message of the month, um, but then also a lot of promos. So like commercials, things like that. We seem to have found, myself and my team, we seem to have found ourselves sort of specialists in case studies. And they're either called testimonials or case studies. Very simple format. Uh, it would basically go, hi, I'm Steve and I make widgets. And I was really struggling to sell widgets. And then Acme came along and they did this wonderful service. And now I sell lots of widgets. And that's pretty much what we do. But we make it sound and look a heck of a lot better than that. Um, but my real passion is documentary. So uh, whenever I can, um, I'll jump on a documentary project and do that. In terms of training, I still really enjoy training. I, I, I find that um, very often you learn just as much as you teach when you deliver training. And so that's where we are today. So um, what we're going to look at today in, in the brief amount of time that we have, which we've only got about an hour, but we'll get through plenty, is uh, making stills move. I'm just going to share my slides here. And um, by the way, we can also... Um, I like to keep things dynamic. So if you do have questions, chuck them in the chat. And if I can, I'll try and address them sort of as we're going along. Um, and yeah, but uh, yeah, so we'll do it that way. So let me go ahead right. and, and share And if, if we screen. get a question in there, I'll jump in and I'll interrupt you and we'll, okay. keep, we'll keep you going. Awesome. Thanks, Troy. You're good. Um, and cool. So everyone can see my slides. Yes, beautiful. Fantastic. Um, so making stills move. Let's just have a quick look at what the agenda is for today. Um, to begin with, we're going to look at shooting for the edit and some guidelines about, even though the session isn't necessarily about editing, um, it's very important to know some basics about editing uh, for video where, you know, generally with photos, you can take an amazing photo and that's just it. The photo may not need any editing. Very rarely can you, you know, film an entire story in one shot. You generally need it, you know, beginning, middle and end, and that will involve some editing. We're then going to look at some, some technical stuff. So we're going to look at you know, frames per second, codecs, shutter speeds, things like that. Um, and then we're going to look at a big part of video, which is audio. And that's something that I'm, I'm quite passionate about, making sure that it, it looks and sounds good. Um, but the first thing that I want to show you is my showreel, because generally the, the structure of these talks is, uh, the first thing I need to show you is, here's why I'm awesome and you should listen to me and you know, give some... Um, yeah, some, some basis of, of here's what I can do. And um, this is why I suppose what I'm saying makes sense. So here's a, a quick look at my showreel.
So there we go. So the, oh, no, let's go back a step. So the first thing is, why do you want to do video? Um, and I'll sort of go with the reasons that a lot of photographers have, have, have mentioned it to me. But if there's anything else that you guys want to sort of specifically cover, uh, feel free to sort of jump in and, and say, say, say that. Uh, but generally, I find that people who are looking to move into video from a photography basis are like, well, I've got the camera. It's got a record button. I may as well sort of record video and, and see what I'm doing. Um, and, and that's sort of like the starting point, but then you can move all the way up to sort of a lot of professional photographers. I've probably had clients request from them. Oh, Hey, you're a photographer, you use a camera. Can you do video for me as well? And for those who were possibly listening in the beginning, when I was, uh, just before we started the, the session proper, um, I was talking about the first time I did some work as a photographer, as opposed to being a, a, a video person. And, you know, it's. It was interesting how even though you know the cameras all work the same sort of thing, um, just composing video was slightly different or composing photos was slightly different from the way you compose photos. And I know a lot of people do both. They do video and photography. I think at least on the day, it's better to focus on one or the other. I think if you're trying to shoot video and then stop and take a couple of photos, like it's possible but if you're trying to do that professionally, I don't think you're actually being quite professional. I think you can do both on the same day, but you should rather sort of go, right, you know what, for the first three hours, we're going to do photos. And then for the next three hours, we're going to do video or whatever the, 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 the breakup is. But I definitely think you want to focus on one of the two at a particular time. You don't want to try and do both at the exact same time. Like it is possible, but very few people's brains are wired that they can make that switch sort of like within within a matter of seconds um so the next thing to look at is that you want to learn to edit first and as i was saying before you know the, the reason why i think that's really important is that you can take an amazing photo and go right well that's a photo done dusted you know, that, that's all I need to do. Whereas with video, generally, you're going to want to edit that video. It's, and it's not going to be a single video. In fact, the, it's also important to think that video is, even though it seems exactly the same, or at least it seems very similar to photography, video is a different way of telling a story. Because if you think about it, in a photo, you need to tell your entire story in that single frame. So in a single photo, you need to, you need your audience to see exactly what's happening in that photo. So you compose the photo, you set it up, click, there's your story. Whereas with video, you've got, well, you've got 25 photos per second to tell that story. So on the one hand, it's cool because you've got a lot more to work with. But on the other hand, you got to sort of think about it a little bit more. And the best example that I can give you, and I'm actually just going to bring up a little video here that I created for the session on this um, is, and I used back in the day when, when I used to do this with actual people in, in the same room as me, what I would do is I was ask, I would ask one of the photographers to pick up a camera and film someone walking through a door. And generally the way that they would do that is they would pick up the camera and they would push record and they would follow the person walking through the door. And that's cool. And yes, you can absolutely, absolutely do that. In fact, I'll bring up a little video here and I'll show you. Here is someone who I just picked up the camera and I followed them walking through the door. And there you go. That played just fine. So, and that was a video that told a story. We followed our character along their journey, we saw them go through the door, there was a change in condition, and they turned around and they'd learned a lesson, how to walk through the door. So that's fine. But as an editor, I look at that and go, oh, dude, you could do so much more. So here is how I would edit together and film a story of someone walking through the door. You start with a low angle, side angle, hand coming through the other side. And the exact same thing has happened. All we've done is we followed someone walking through a door, but I've used three or four different angles to tell the story in a much more, I think, interesting visual way. Just a quick, uh, 
just a quick check in. Is it like the video's playing? Everything's cool. Just a thumbs up from folks. And, yep, that's yep. Yeah, and it that, looks great. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. And, and that's making sense in terms of how. So, I suppose the the really important thing that I want to get across from from this little bit of the spiel is even if you're not planning on editing any video yourself, like if you're looking at moving into doing video professionally and you're like, cool, I'm going to shoot the video um, and I'm going to hire an editor to do that. That's totally fine. Um, but I think it's very important to sit down with that editor and watch them edit and get an idea of what kind of shots an editor is looking for, because the more you edit, the better you'll be as a shooter, the better you'll learn like you'll get into the edit. And I, I mean, I still do this to this day where you get into the edit. You're like, oh, you know what? I wish I'd gotten a wide shot of this. Or I wish I'd gotten a close up of that. It would like, it would really help me to tell the story if I had a shot of whatever. So every time you edit, you will learn more and more and you will learn better in terms of what stuff to think about when you're doing the shoot so that you get to the edit and you've got the content that you needed to work with. Um, a phrase that I often use with clients when they're kind of going, oh, uh, look, you know, the budget's not quite, you know, where, where, what you're asking for. Do we really need that third day to go and shoot whatever it is we were going to shoot on the third day? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I always say to them, well, look, you know, when it comes to the edit, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So that's sort of where I'm going. And, and if you're just sort of starting out, an easy rule of thumb is first thing you do when you get to a location where you're shooting and Troy, this, this could work to you with, with the wedding. And I mean, I'm sure you probably do this mostly as a photographer anyway, is first thing you do is you get at least three wide shots because your wide shots are going to establish for your audience where the story is happening. So let's say for example, I'm shooting a promo for a, a burger, a burger, a burger restaurant. So the first thing I'm going to do when I get there is I'm going to get at least three different wide shots of the exterior of the burger restaurant. Then you want to get, and you, it, there's the rule of threes. It's a rule I've just made up, but generally people work in threes. So I go with three wides, six mediums, nine tight shots. So you get three wide shots, establish the location. And then when you go inside again, three wide shots of the inside, then you want at least six medium shots. And so, for example, if you're shooting people, um, a medium shot would sort of be waist to the forehead. That's kind of your medium shot. Um, I just realized that my camera here is not wide enough to see where my lower hand is going, but assume that it's at the bottom of my waist. Um, so, you know, so waist up, up to above the head. And then your tight shots. And your tight shots, and again, this is just like most artistic things, there, isn't, there aren't a lot of right and wrongs. There's general rules and those rules can all be absolutely broken as long as you've got a good reason to break them. Um, but then you get into your nine close-up shots. And at least for me, the close-up shots are where I get to play and where I get to make things really pretty and I get to play with focus pulls and I get to really show off the detail and I can mess around with some movement. Um, you know, generally my wides are, eh, it's a wide, it's a landscape shot. Click, done, great. Um, you know, your, your, your medium shots are, again, sort of telling the story. And if, let's say, two people are talking to each other, that's kind of like the medium shot of showing their torsos of them talking. But the, the close-up shots... That's when you're, you know, again, if we talk about two people talking to each other, you're focusing on someone's eye or you're looking at their hand movements or, you know, those are the really lovely, intricate details that are telling your story. So those are some things to think about when you're out there shooting. You always need to be shooting for the edit because the edit is going to happen regardless. So you always want to be thinking about what kind of shots do I need for my edit? Um, and that's something that, I've gotten a lot better in over the years where, you know, you go to a shoot, it's been a long day. And like, oh, I just, I just can't be bothered to get that extra shot. Trust me, get the extra shot because when you get to the edit point, it'll totally be worth it. So Lee, yeah. um, Stephen Sharp is asking, how do you decide how to block out the shots you will want to take beforehand? Like for example, in that second video. So you've, you've, I think you've kind of answered that, right? It's just this idea that you need to know what the scenery is going to be and what your story is going to end up with. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you definitely, you want to have an idea of what the story is, um, and it depends on the project. So, for example, you know, with a corporate shoot, we will storyboard that out. So, we will actually have 
Um, if I can go to the location and do a location scout, great. Um, a lot of times there either isn't time or budget for that. So what we'll do is I'll get the client to just take photos with their phone or just do a video walkthrough of their offices. Let's say we're shooting at their office. I'll ask them to do a video walkthrough, just, you know, grab your phone, turn it sideways into landscape because nobody's TV is mounted on their wall like this. It's all like that. Mm. Um, so, you know, turn your phone to landscape, walk around the room with the, as wide a lens as possible and just give me an idea as if I was there and then I'll do a little storyboard. And when I say storyboard, again, it all comes down to budget and skill level. Like my artistic skill level is stick figures. So if I'm doing the storyboard, you know, I'm just making blocks on a page and I'm doing stick figures and I'm writing in wide shot, need the back of this person's head or something like that. Um, but if there's budget and it's a more high end thing, um, I'll actually get an artist to come in and help like make a pretty kind of storyboard for the client. Um, so yeah, it, it's one of the, like I was saying in terms of like, these aren't hard and like these are rules, but they're perfectly broken. So if you can plan and there's the ability to plan, the more you plan, the less work you'll have on the day and the better the product will be that you produce on the day. Um, having said that, sometimes you can't plan like documentary shoots most of the time you're turning up completely blind. Um, and that's just one of those, like the more you do it, the better you get at it. So particularly if you want to sort of get into documentaries and stuff, and this is something that I did is make up your own documentaries. Like say to a friend of yours, Hey, you know how you really love gardening. Can I come interview? Can I come interview you about gardening and just go and do a you know, quick little three, five minute piece on their passion for gardening. And I guarantee you, you will learn so much that when it then gets time to actually sort of charging people money for it, um, you'll feel a lot more confident in yourself as well. So just, you know, do it whenever you can. And even still today, I do, you know, some pro bono stuff for, you know, some charities that I really believe in. Um, a, because it's, you know, you're getting to help a good cause, but I'm getting help just as much because every job that I do, I learn more from it. All good? Cool. Um, so let's get into some nerdy stuff. Um, so, and now just for a little math. Um, and you'll notice that I have gone with the American way because the rest of the world puts an S on it, but hey, you you guys do you. So we didn't decide um, that. We didn't we didn't get the vote. It's not <laughs> like they asked us and said, what do you want? Did somebody else decide it? <laughs> so someone make a suggestion. Um, <laughs> so when I'm talking about frame rate, so frame rate is the way that a camera and, and forgive me if I'm sort of telling your folks how to suck eggs and, and most of you know this already, but just in case I want to make sure that we cover these basics. So everyone's kind of on the same playing field. Um, and so frame rates are how cameras capture video. So basically all video is, is a whole bunch of photos captured really quickly. So your generally your frame rates for film or video starts at 24 frames per second or 23.98. And that is traditionally the frame rate that film was shot at. So there's this whole thing amongst filmmakers um, where, you know, if you want your, your film to look filmic and you don't want it to look video, um, you shoot at 24 frames per second. To be honest, I could take it or leave it. Like there is a nice sort of aesthetic to it, but these days, most things being delivered online anyway. So it doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, so that's 24 frames per second. The next two are 25 and 30 frames per second. Now, I'm guessing for most of this audience, you're probably based in North America. So you don't really need to worry too much about the 25 frames per second. Um, and you may have heard these two names something differently. So 25 frames per second is called PAL and 30 frames per second is called NTSC. And so basically NTSC or 30 frames per second is the format that's used in North America, Japan, and I think like one or two other countries. Um, and 25, which is PAL, is used pretty much everywhere else in the world. And the reason for these two different uh, frames per second is actually because of the electrical frequencies of the countries. So in the NTSC countries, um, the electrical frequencies are at 60 hertz, and the PAL countries, it's 50 hertz. And so the reason why you have to shoot at these different frame rates is so that your frame rate matches kind of the frequency of the electrical currents going into your lights so you don't get flicker does that make sense yep makes sense. so for example yep. so for example when if anyone's got a smartphone and you've told your smartphone to shoot in super in slow-mo 
what slow motion is on a, on a smartphone is it's capturing at a really high frame rate. So it might be capturing at 60 frames per second, but it might be capturing at 100 frames per second or 200 frames per second or 300 frames per second. And so because it's capturing at that different frame rate, generally, if you're capturing slow-mo on a phone, anywhere that's lit electrically, you're going to get flicker on your video. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll send you guys, I'll, Troy, I'll send you a link. I did a, vi a video, it's on my YouTube channel. It's actually one of the most popular videos on my YouTube channel. It's a little five-minute tip on how you can try and remove that flicker in post. Um, it's a really random, cool little trick that you wouldn't have thought of, but it works 50% of the time, which is pretty good. Um, so that's so I have frame an, I have a question for you on the yes. SES. So if you're, you know, like if you're shooting somebody walking, like in a like in a wedding versus say motorsports, we got somebody mm -hmm. on a motorcycle coming down the track really fast. Does frame rate make a difference? Should you be shooting one or the other? No. So it 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 depends. With all of these things, it depends on what you want to do with it in post. So if you want to slow it down, then you shoot at the highest frame rate your camera can do. Because if you think about it, when you're playing it back, let's go with 30 frames per second. So we are playing this video at the moment at 30 frames per second. If we wanted to slow this down by 50%, well, now we actually need to play 60 frames for every second because it's doubled the amount of frames that we need because we're switching, we're switching those frames into the same amount of time. Does that make sense? So basically, if I wanted to play something at, at half the speed, I would have to capture twice as many frames. If I want to play it at 25% of that speed, I would have to capture four times as many frames. So the high, so like, so for example, if, for those who used to watch a show called Mythbusters, they used to have these wonderful super slow-mo shots. And that was done, I think, I think it was on a fan, I think the camera was called a Phantom. And that was a ridiculously crazy camera, which shot at like a thousand frames per second. But because like in order to capture a thousand frames per second, the camera has to be so powerful. You could basically only capture like three seconds at a time. Like you basically push go, it captures three seconds, which is 3000 frames. And then it's got a buffer and it's got to stop and you got to like wait for it to cool down sort of thing. Um, so in answer to your question, Troy, in terms of um, what you're shooting, like how fast the movement is, your frame rate is irrelevant if you're playing it back at the same speed that you're shooting it at. But if you want to slow it down, so if you were shooting that person running, but you want to show that running in slow-mo, then you would shoot at as high a frame rate as possible. And you can slow it down even if you haven't shot in a high frame rate, but the less frames you have, the choppier your video will get. Because if you think about it, you're trying to play frames that don't exist. So your video editing software will sort of try and create them. And there's some, I think it's Topaz makes a, 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 a thing called AI Labs, which apparently like it sort of uses AI to recreate the missing frames and your hit rates kind of here or there in terms of what it gets, but that's basically it. Um, did that answer your question? And, and I'm going to sort of touch on that answer again in the next little bit that we're going to talk about. Perfect. Um, so that's your frame rates. Does that all make sense to everyone? Yep, seeing so nods, cool. Um, so shutter speed and 180 degree rule, 180 degree thing. Now, I also mentioned there's 280 degree rules um, that are completely different. And I'll remind me to cover the second one because I'll probably forget when I cover this first one. So this is talking about what shutter speed to set for your camera. Now, ISO and aperture works exactly the same in video as it does in stills. So if you want a shallow depth of field, you set your, your, shallow, your aperture to whatever you want your shallow depth of field to be, works exactly the same for video. Your ISO, if it's really bright, have it nice and low. If it's really dark and you want a brighter shot, bump up your ISO, your shot's gonna get as noisy, just like photography, exactly the same thing. Shutter speed is different though, because your shutter speed will dictate how movement looks in your video. So here's what I mean. To, your, to the natural human eye, if I'm waving my hand like this, you don't see my fingers distinctly, like as each individual finger, you see some sort of blurry. And that's called motion blur because the human eye naturally sees motion blur. And in order to get your footage 
to give you that natural motion blur, you want to set your shutter speed to double your frame rate. So if you're shooting at 30 frames per second, you want to set your shutter speed to a 60th. If you're shooting at 100 frames per second, you want to set your shutter speed to a 200th, so on and so forth. Now, let me, uh, here's a little video I prepared earlier <coughs> to show you what happens when you don't lock your shutter speed to those things. So if you make your shutter speed really low, so let's say you're shooting at a 10th, you're going to get a really, really blurry video, but it's going to be too blurry. Like it's not going to be natural. It's going to look just like, you know, someone just took oil and threw it over an oil painting and, you know, everything's just running. Whereas if you set your shutter speed really high, you're going to get this feature called staccato, where if I did this, you would actually see like 20 fingers because it's moving, but it would show each individual finger like clearly. <clears throat> so here's a little video that I created to demonstrate the difference with the blur that you get with different shutter speeds. So here's me twirling a cable at a shutter speed of a tenth. Five. Here's at 25 frames per second. Sorry, at, at a 25th. So that's kind of right. And this is at a 50th. So this is sort of natural blur that the human eye would naturally see. <coughs> and then this is 500th. And so you can see like that doesn't look natural. And then at 1600, it really looks weird. And this is a really good example of Yes, there are rules, but yes, you can totally break those rules as long as you've got a good reason for it. One of the most famous um, examples of this rule being broken is the first is, is the Normandy invasion scene of Saving Private Ryan. So for those who've seen Saving Private Ryan, there's the, you know, the troops landing in Normandy. That was shot in, in, in film terms, we call it overcranking, where they set their shutter speed higher than it should have been. And so... The, Bless you, Stephen. Um, and so they, so the movement looks weird. The movement looks staccato. The, 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 the natural blur isn't there. And what it normally makes people feel naturally is it, like your audience will feel a bit odd and a bit off kilter and they won't know why. And Steven Spielberg deliberately did this with that opening scene in Private Ryan because he wanted the audience to feel, oh, like the, the, something's not right. Um, so again, that's a perfect example of, yeah, you know, he broke the rule, but he broke the rule deliberately for a good reason because he wanted his audience to feel a little bit off kilter. Um, if you don't want your audience to feel off kilter, always have your shutter speed to being double your frame rate. Now, this brings us on to a little thing about gear because if you think about it, um, is that um, actually just before we get onto audio, the thing that you want to think about with this is, let me just turn off my screen sharing so you can sort of see, I just want to show you some toys. have up there but anyway you'll, you'll you'll get what sort of what i'm saying is one thing you absolutely have to have when you're shooting video is nd filters because if you're shooting outside on a sunny day and you need to lock your shutter speed to a 60th and you don't want to go above it because you want your your blur to look natural um how are you going to keep your shot from being completely overexposed and blown out you're going to use nds so for video, you definitely want to have NDs. And again, this is sort of what works for you as an individual. I go with variable NDs because I just can't be bothered to switch my NDs in and out. Um, for those who aren't familiar with what a variable ND is, is basically they take two NDs and you just rotate them, rotate them across each other and your image basically gets darker or brighter depending on what you're doing with how you're rotating the ND. So if you're going to be shooting outside, um, you definitely want to invest in NDs. And that's why, for example, if you're shooting with a smartphone, uh, particularly with the native smartphone app, they don't let you control your shutter speed or anything like that. And if you're shooting outside on a bright day, the movement, like they've gotten a lot better using AI to try and overcome that, that, that staccato sort of look, but the movement just won't look quite right, um, which is why I've got NDs for my smartphone, but that's another story. Um, any questions so far? Um, Karen asked, um, what is the basic equipment to start shooting video? Like, do, does she need a tripod? Do you need a handheld gimbal? You know, all the things. 
Oh, well, I mean, that, that, that can start at not zero. Not for you, God. though, for the normal yeah. person, right? Not for, not for yeah. Lee. <laughs> well, well, look, you know, look, it also depends on what you want to achieve from your video. Like, if you want to just learn, you have a camera, you have everything you need. So, like, as long as you've got a camera that shoots video, push that video button, start playing around and see what happens. Um, the first thing I would suggest you invest in is a microphone. And that actually gets us very nicely into our next topic, which is audio. So let me just quickly bring up my slides again. And so audio is, I think, even more important than video when it comes to, to shooting video. And the reason for that is you could have the most beautiful cinematic, I'm talking like Academy Award winning stuff, um, in terms of your video, but if the audio is no good, people are going to tune off within a matter of seconds, if not a matter of minutes. Whereas you could have footage that is pretty average, but if the audio is good, oh shush, Siri. But if the audio is good, people will stick with it. Like you got a good story, you got good audio, you can get away with average footage. Um, but if you don't have good audio and you've got great story and great footage, good luck. Um, so it's really, really important to have as good as audio as possible. So the first thing you want to do is get a microphone. I don't care what microphone, just get any microphone. Um, I'll have some better recommendations, but get a microphone. Because the thing is, the microphones that are built into cameras, particularly stills cameras, uh, they may as well just be there for show. Um, so like, it's better than nothing, but not much. So get a mic. And the first rule of thumb to learn about audio is you want to get your microphone as close as possible to the source of the audio that you're trying to capture. So again, it depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're doing an interview in a perfect world, you would get the microphone on your subject. So for example, like if you think like whenever you watch the nightly news, you see those little microphones on their, on their chests. So that's called a lapel mic or, or a lavalier mic. Um, and that's your best option for interviews because you're getting the microphone as close as possible to the audio source, which is the person's mouth. Um, I don't know, Troy, is the camera on me or is it just on my slide at the moment? I'm not it's sure. It's on the slide at the moment. It's on the I mean, slide. Okay, let me... Yeah, you're, you're, you'll be a thumbnail on their screen. So if you turn off okay, your but, screen- but, Okay, screen, but you can, can still see it. a thumbnail of me. So, so the ideal distance of the microphone and you get, the, you get your subject to do this themselves because everyone's hand is different. You get them to do an, a aloha and then you put the thumb on the lower lip and wherever the pinky ends up, that's generally what, where you want to place the microphone. Not a perfect thing, but this is, this is a really good, if you'll pardon the pun, rule of thumb um, as to where to put your lapel mic. And generally, that's going to end up sort of in the solar plexus, right, right in the middle of the chest bone. And that's really good because that's a good distance away. Like it's not too close, not too far. That's a good way. And most lapel mics are what are called omnidirectional. So generally, you don't have to worry about whether you're sticking on upside down, sideways, whatever. The microphone is designed to capture audio in a bubble around it. So wherever the mic is, as long as it's within that purview, you're good. Um, for the longest time, I used to place, you know, I, used, I do a lot of corporate stuff. I used to place the microphone under the person's collar on their shirt. Uh, and the reason for that is I'm really pedantic about hiding microphones because I feel that if the, if my audience sees the microphone, it kind of ruins the magic a little bit. So I, I'm all about hiding the mic. Don't worry about hiding the mic yourselves. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a compunction obsession, whatever you want to call it, that you can worry about down the track. Um, when you're starting out, just put, at least hide the cable, at least do that. Um, but yeah, hide the mic. So I used to hide it un, under the, um, under the person's collar, which was fine as long as they're always sort of talking to someone in front of them. But I made the mistake of hiding the microphone under someone's collar when they were doing a panel discussion. And they sounded great when they were talking this way, not so great when they were talking to the other side of their head. So that's why you put it in the middle, because that way, even if they're talking from side to side, at least you're right in the middle. So you're, you're going to capture the best audio. So that's a lapel mic. Um, so you can get a lapel mic on someone and you can get lapel mics for like 20 bucks and above. Um, a really good starter one is one called, uh, there's an Australian company called Rode. So they make a lot of really great microphones and they make the, I think it's called the Rode Lav Plus, which I think in the US is probably about 30 or $40. And the cool thing about this is this plugs into a smartphone. So you could be filming with your camera 
and have the microphone plugged into your smartphone and just you know put the smartphone in the back pocket of the person that you're filming but the microphone's coming out of the smartphone via a cable and it's just sitting on their chest like that one little tip with that make sure you put your phone into airplane mode before the interview starts because if you get a call while the interview is going it will stop recording i learned that the hard way um, and because you're not looking at the phone you have no idea until you get home and you're like why did the audio stop halfway ah crap um lee um, what were those other little um uh, uh microphone and receivers that you had the magnetic ones these ones ah yes ah so did I, did I cut you the head no, 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 no. It's just, I've, I've got four of them stuck to my desk because they're magnetic. Um, so this is a really, really cool um, bit of kit that I got. And I'll just hold there. So let's see if it focuses good enough. Yeah. So there's a thing called an Instamic. Um, I think they're about $200 US. So not, not, the, not the cheapest sort of thing to get into. Um, but basically this is a microphone and a recorder all on its own. So it's got eight gigs of internal storage. It's a waterproof stereo mic so originally i bought these because i was going to use these for basically ambient sounds so when we were doing car commercials and things like that i would stick this to the bottom of the car and get the muffler sounds out of that um and if the car got splashed with water we're like this is waterproof to like 30 feet or something like that so it's really really cool and because it can record internally you just switch it on hit record and it starts recording um the challenge with that though is you can't monitor it which means you can't listen to what it's recording while it's recording. You only know what it recorded after the fact. Um, now you can control it with an app. So you can hear from the app, but there's a lot of stuff going on. So this, this is good. And it comes with a really powerful magnet. So the way that it, the, the magnet uh, just sort of connects like that. So if I want to put this on a subject, I can just put it inside the shirt, put the magnet on the outside and hey, presto, I've got a little lapel mic going on and it's really easy. Um, and you don't have to worry about a cable. So this is a, this is definitely a good starting point. Um, and this is a good, if you don't have any other solution, like I always say to um, other cinematographers um, is have two of these in your bag, because very often you'll go to a shoot where the client has said to you, Hey, we just want you to come and film this event. We don't need to get any audio. We aren't doing any interviews. We just want you to shoot the event. And you get there and invariably they go, oh, by the way, the CEO's here today. Can we do a quick interview with the CEO? And you're like, oh, for him. but I didn't, you know, so I've always got these in my bag now so that if a surprise interview happens, these are perfectly reasonable for using for interviews. Like to give you an idea of the kind of stuff that I would normally use for interviews. Um, I've got a few sets of these. And so... These are wireless transmitters. So this is the transmitter. So this would be sitting on my subject. Um, then the receiver would be sitting on my camera. Um, and these, well, actually, I've, I've got even smaller microphones than this. But this gives you an idea of the, the size of the microphone that I'm placing on inside the person's shirt or something like that. So it's much easier to hide because it's tiny. Um, so... So Lee, when you're, so just to clarify on the, on the iPhone recorder, it's actually recording to the iPhone. Yes. Uh, Steven asked that. And then also, um, once you've recorded that audio, how do you synchronize that with the video? That seems like something that's important. That is a very good question. Um, so that's also why you would have, um, you would obviously be recording the audio on your camera. Um, and this is pretty much all that the audio on your camera is going to be good for. Um, and you know, when, you know, when you're watching movies and they've got the little clapper board and they go, blah, 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 take one. That is so that when you're editing later, that, that clap in, in the editing application is going to show up as a giant spike in your waveform. And now most applications have got like a built-in thing where you can go synchronize these two clips and they'll take the audio and then synchronize them. But if you've at least got that clap, you can visually see where that spike is in your audio and you can move your clips one on like the video on top of the audio and you can line them up so you can synchronize them like that. So that's, that's why also if you ever, whenever you're doing external audio, always do a clap. Um, when you get into fancier things like, you know, like my... This is my little camera. Um, my bigger cameras have got a thing called time code that's, oops, um, have got a thing called time code that's built into them. So they've got like super 
powerful clocks built into them that that keep time code to a tenth of a second sort of thing. And so I synchronize my audio recorders with those. And so I just go sync by time code and it just automatically does it for me. Um, but yeah, that was, I've only been using time code for like the last two or three years. Up until then, I've just been using and it works just great. Also, yeah, a lot of applications you, uh, will also, um, when you import them, you can get them to auto sync your audio and your video, like Final Cut Pro does that. I know DaVinci does that. I don't know about um, some of the other ones, um, but that's yeah, helpful. So, you, so, so absolutely, you can sort of do it yourself. Um, and for those of you guys watching, um, Lee has an amazing Capture One. I, I keep saying Capture One. I don't know why I keep saying that. A Final Cut Pro course for those of us that are on Macs um, that it's going to be available and well, it should be any, any week now. I actually watched it a, a while ago and it was super helpful. So all the stuff he's talking about, he actually demos live in, in his course. So hopefully some of that stuff will be out soon. Yeah, that should be, that should be out next week, hopefully. So, yeah. So that's, that's talking all about the editing side of things, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's covering the editing side. So the next thing to look at is shotgun versus lav. So as I was talking about, lav mic is generally called lavalier mic that you put on your subject. And a shotgun mic is something like this. So um, hang on, let me just... So can everyone see in my little thumbnail what I'm holding up to the camera? Yep, so it looks like a little hot dog. And so this goes on top of your camera. And this is sort of what I would recommend also if you're starting out. And a shotgun mic, as the name would suggest, is going to try and capture audio in a shotgun pattern in front of the microphone. So a shotgun mic will try and ignore the audio coming from behind it, and it'll try and ignore the audio coming from the side and just sort of capture the audio in front. So if you can't get a lavalier microphone on your subject, um, a shotgun is your next best bet. And you know, generally, like when you see in movies and they've got the boom pole and they've got like a mic on the boom pole, that's a shotgun mic. Cause that's, again, they're trying to get it as close as possible, but worst comes to worse, this will still be better than just about anything that's built into any camera. So even if you're just starting off with one of these, a little shotgun mic's also really great. And I think these are also about sort of 80 bucks in terms of what you're looking for for, for, for price. Um, and also you want more than one microphone, ideally, because if you've shot your footage and it's too dark, you can make it brighter. If you've shot it too bright, well, it's overexposed, but if it's not overexposed and it's just too bright, you can kind of fix it. If you've shot at the wrong white balance, you can kind of fix it. If you've done the wrong sort of coloring, you can kind of fix it. If you've stuffed up your audio, it is most likely going to be impossible or super expensive to fix it. So the audio, again, I cannot stress this enough. Audio is definitely one of the most important things to get right in camera because um, it's really hard to fix it later. So a preamp, and I won't go into too much detail, but a preamp is basically the thing in your camera that or your audio recording device that, that captures that audio. And the preamps that are built into cameras are okay, I guess, at best. Um, so even if you're using a mic like this, again, using a mic like this, going to the preamp on a camera, heck of a lot better than the built-in microphone. But sort of going the next step up is that if you are having your audio going into the lab or something like that, get a dedicated audio recorder and have your microphone going to that. So this is one of my smaller ones. Um, so this is a Zoom H5, I think it's called. Um, we can just take that. So that's basically what it is. And so this is a, a proper audio recorder and this has got really great preamps, um, but you can get sort of the entry level ones of these versions is the H1. They started about a hundred bucks, I think. And so your microphone goes into that and that records the audio on that. Um, so that's also just something to think about when you're getting a bit more serious about audio. Clapperboards. So just simply because doing this starts to hurt your hand after a while. So you get one of those little boards and, and you, can, you can find cheap ones for like you know, 20, 30 bucks. And particularly on a corporate shoot, you let the client come in and do that and they feel so special. It's awesome. So it's like, you can charge them like an extra hundred bucks an hour just for that alone. Um, and this, this last point about we'll fix it in, we'll fix it in post with audio. No, you bloody well won't. So 
um, to give you an idea, I've got one of the best audio repair tools around. It's a, 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 it's a company called Isotope and they make a, 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 a plugin, a, an application called RX. Um, so I, Isotope RX. And that costs, I think, about $1,200. And it's probably the best money I've ever spent on any software in terms of how much it has saved my butt um, where things have gone wrong with audio and I've just managed to fix it where it still annoys me, but the client definitely doesn't notice. Um, now I've got a couple of videos that I want to show you to give you an idea about the difference of types of audio that you're going to get out of your microphones, specifically in different environments. So one is shot inside and one is shot outside. And the reason for that is when you think about audio, audio is a wave. So if you're in a small tiled room with hard flat surfaces, your audio waves are going to come out of your mouth, hit that wall, bounce back off the wall and bounce back towards you. And that's where you get that sort of room echo that you hear on microphones. So the further away you get from the microphone, the more echo you're going to get. You're not going to get that much from me because I've got an entire wall of sound insulation in front of me. And sound insulation is that stuff that you would see um, when you go to recording studios or you see photos of recording studios. It's like that undulating foam that you see on the wall. And the reason why that's really good is that's absorbent. So that's literally like absorbing the audio that's coming into it. And also the shapes is breaking up the audio waves. So it's doing two things to lessen as much as possible that audio bouncing back at you. Um, now, obviously in a perfect world, we don't live in a perfect world, so you can't always have that stuff with you. But I've actually got two just little cardboard, like I took the, the, the sides of two, like I took the cardboard box that my refrigerator came in, cut off two sides of it and just stuck um, those foam things onto them. And I you know, painted them to make them look fancy. And then I take those off to shoots and I'll just have those sitting behind me because if you think about it, normally my talent's talking towards me and the camera. And so if those are sitting behind me, the sound of them talking is going to get absorbed, hopefully, by those foam walls behind me. And you can get sound blankets as well if you want to. But without further ado, let's just play these quick videos. You'll get an idea of the different sort of sound that you get out of different microphones. This is a quick video to show you the difference in sound levels you'll get from various microphones depending on what distance they are and what they're plugged into. So I've got some microphones plugged into my camera, I've got some plugged into my Zoom H6 and some plugged into my iPhone. And in terms of ambient noise, what we've got is a little bit of sound coming from the heat coming through the ducts in the ceiling. We've got my Synology's over here on my right whirring away. We might get some noise if a car drives past outside. So I'm going to say the same phrase over and over for the different microphones and you can hear what it sounds like. So to begin with we've got my built-in mic on my Sony a7S which is probably about oh, I don't know five or seven feet away from me. I like big butts and I cannot lie. Then we've got a Rode video mic attached to my Panasonic GH4 which is also about five or six feet away from me. I like big butts and I cannot lie. Then we've got my Rode NTG2 just above my head here. I like big butts and I cannot lie. Then we've got a Rode Video Mic Pro sitting on my desk, but this one's only about three feet away from my mouth. I like big butts and I cannot lie. Then we have a Rode Smart Lab Plus, which is plugged into my iPhone over here on my desk. I like big butts and I cannot lie. And finally, we've got the Rode Lab on my chest over here as well, and that's going through my Rode Link wireless system. I like big butts and I cannot lie. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how that all sounds and shows you that when you want to capture And now we'll look at outdoor. So this video is to demonstrate the different sound levels you're going to get from various different microphones at different distances from your sound source. Again, the sound source being me. We're in an outdoor environment here, so there's different things to deal with than in an indoor environment. We don't have as much echo because there's no walls for the sound to bounce off of, but we've got birds chirping and nature and all sorts of things flying around making sound. So let's look at the setup and what it's going to sound like. We've got two cameras with microphones about five or six feet away and then the rest of these are closer to me. So first of all, we've got the just the built-in microphone on my Sony A7S. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. Then we've got a first generation Rode VideoMic Pro on my Panasonic GH4, again about five or six feet away. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. Then we have a whole bunch of mics plugged into my Zoom H6 here on the table. 
first of all, we've got the Video Mic Pro about three feet away from me. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. Then we have the Rode NTG2 just above my head here. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. We have the Rode SmartLav Plus connected to my chest here, going into my iPod Touch. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. And finally, we have the Rode Lav plugged into my Rode Link wireless system going into my Zoom H6. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. And that's all the different microphones at various different distances. So, um, that gives you an idea of, of how that all sounds. And so, you know, as you could have heard, um, the built-in mics really didn't, I mean, you could still hear what I was saying and it was clear, but they were nowhere as good as the mics that were gradually getting closer and closer to the source of the audio. So hopefully that really sort of hits home as, as to how important it is to get your mic as close as possible to the source of audio. So just sort of going over some guidelines in terms of what we've spoken about today, we've spoken about shutter speed. So when you're thinking about shutter speed, your shutter speed should always be double your frame rate if you want the motion blur to look natural. Um, shoot for the edit. So it's really, really important to think about your edit before you go out and shoot, just to have an idea. If you're just starting, it's absolutely fine to sort of just go out and start shooting stuff, but you'll very quickly learn as you start editing, oh, I should have shot this, I should have shot that. But you know what? It's If you're alive, you're learning. So don't worry about making mistakes. That's one of the best ways to learn. Unless you're a doctor, don't, don't learn on the job with that. Um, never cut anything you've shot. Now, this is an interesting one. So when I was starting out, um, I did a, a, actually a, a session similar to this um, with, with an amazing cinematographer, uh, Vincent Lafare. And he was saying that, and I learned this from him, where he said, you should never, you should never edit something that you yourself has shot. And on the one hand, no, none of us play by this rule, but it's something to keep in mind when you're editing, because as an editor, your job is very different from a cinematographer. As an editor, your job is to tell the story in the most concise way possible. So you are there to slash and burn. You are there to go, if this shot doesn't make sense, it doesn't make it into the final cut. Whereas if you're a cinematographer, you're sitting there going, oh, we spent three hours in the snow. This is the most beautiful sunset ever. We've got to keep the shot in the edit. You got to take that hat off, put on your editor shot and go, I don't care. It doesn't help the story. The shot gets cut. And we all are, we all have varying degrees of how good or bad we are with this. Um, B-roll, B-roll, B-roll. Now, I haven't mentioned this word before, but B-roll um, is basically the extra footage that you've shot to represent what, what your subject is talking to. So generally, the stuff that I shoot is interviews. And if your interview was just looking at someone's head going blah, 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 blah for you know even three minutes, that's a little bit boring. So you want what's called B-roll or cutaways to visually represent what they're talking about. The way that I always explain this to clients is if I, I say to them, well, look, if we're interviewing you, and you say, I love sitting in roundabout chairs and going, wee. Well, now we need footage of you sitting in a roundabout chair going, wee. So that when you're saying that, we're going to play the footage of what you're talking about. Does that all make sense for, in terms of what B-roll is? Cool. And the thing with B-roll is there is no such thing as too much B-roll. Because when you are editing, you'll be going, oh, this shot doesn't work. This shot doesn't work. Like the more options you have of B-roll within reason, um, the better. So always shoot more B-roll than you think you're going to need because you'll never have enough. So the 180 degree, 80 degree rule. So you remember how the first 180 degree rule I was talking about was that you have to set your shutter speed to double your frame rate. The second 180 degree rule is when you're filming two people talking to each other. So if you're doing an interview where one person is sitting over here and talking to this person over there and the other person is sitting like this, talking to that exact person, you have to pretend like there is a line that is drawn between those two people and your two cameras that are filming those two people cannot cross that line. So if, you have, if you're shooting two people talking to each other, one camera needs to be over the right shoulder of the one person and over the left shoulder of the other person. It cannot be over the left shoulder of both of them diagonally from each other. 
And the reason for that is that'll look like they're talking to themselves because the angle, when you bring it up on, 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 on the screen will be like, hang on, they're both looking in the same direction. That, that doesn't look right. So that's a really easy one to remember, but it's one that I see, I, I teach a few times a year. I, I teach a media class in a high school. I see them do this a lot. Don't do it. So yeah, 180 degree. Once you know that one, again, if you want to make your audience go, why are they both looking in the same direction? Absolutely break the rule, but know that you're breaking the rule. And that last one where we'll fix it in post. No, you bloody well won't. So there's a lot of things that you can fix in post, but ideally you want to get it right in camera because it's going to be so much easier to get it right on the day on set in camera, than spend time and money trying to fix it in post where you may not be able to. And with that, that is me. So let's open the floor. I've got a few minutes. Um, I'm going to try and hang around for at least another 10, 15 minutes um, and we can go to questions. Yeah, you guys can go ahead and unmute your mics. Um, Lee, thank you so much for running through that. There, I, I, I can say from somebody who's touched on doing some video that all those points that you made are absolutely um, valid and much harder to perform live than it is <laughs> to, to, you know, but that's how most lessons are, right? Like, yeah. like at, at F64, we did all these interviews with the instructors. And at one point, one of the microphones on one of the instructors uh, failed during the interview and I had to use the ambient audio. And oh, oh my God, I spent more time editing that one five minute interview than I did the other 10 instructors. And it still sounded like garbage. So yeah. yeah. And that's the, it's with, with audio, like it, it, there's, there's not a lot you can do. Yeah, we, we have a question in here from Mark, and uh, it's in a language I probably can't even pronounce, but he says, is there a big difference between the NTG1 versus 2, 3, and 4? I have the NTG1, and it's good, but it's not as good as I thought it would be at rejection. Um, so, so just to explain to everyone else what we're talking about, um, the NTG1, 2, 3, and 4 are different, different models of shotgun microphones um, that are made by a company called Rode. Um, I've got... I think the two, I forget to be honest, because um, I don't use shotguns that much anymore. I'm all about the Pell mics now. Um, mics are, I'm sorry, but I'm going to give you one of those, it depends answers in the <laughs> sense that, you know, it, it's very dependent on the environment in terms of which one's better for, for, for which environment. Um, so, I mean, the, like the NTG, the NTG3 is, is, is still probably, it's one of the oldest and it's probably one of the best all-rounder so the ntg3 is a really good all-rounder um i still like the ntg4 or the ntg4 plus and this is more for practical reasons um the ntg4 plus uh, so the ntg4 and the ntg4 plus are pretty much the same except the ntg4 plus has got a built-in battery that is powered over usb um which i'm just anything that means i don't have to carry more double a's with me i'm all about that so for me when i was sort of very big on using shotgun mics um i had the ntg4 as well as my ntg2 and i actually ended up getting rid of the ntg4 because i just wasn't using shotgun mics that often and the two is better than the four but the three is probably the best of the lot so i hope that kind of answers the question sort of does yeah thank you yeah i just yeah, I, I, I i thought maybe mark was making fun with me because he, i don't know what any of those terms were but <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a, uh, you know, the thing is, what I found is that it, it seems to matter an awful lot where I place the NT, the NTGs because their Absolutely. placement is really, yeah. it's, it's a weird kind of, what it rejects is kind of weird. It's kind of yeah. doesn't always do yeah. a really yeah. good job. Well, and also it, like, it'll depend on, I mean, it, seriously, like it'll depend on the pressure in the room as well. Okay. Like, like, like all sorts, like microphones are, microphones are, it's easier to understand women than it is to understand microphones. <laughs> um, but also very often it's user error. So I'll give you a funny story. Um, I had the NTG, oh no, it's the NTG A, which is like a, like a podcasting mic like this um, that I used to use before this microphone. And for the longest time, like my audio was just soft and I couldn't work out like why it was soft. And my, my brother-in-law used to be an, used to be an audio engineer. He's a cop now, but he used to be an audio engineer. And I, he, he was like over at my place. Once, I was like, Hey, Anthony, can you just come have a look at this and tell me what I'm doing wrong? He's like, yeah, you see this little silver dot on the back of your microphone that tells you what side you need to talk into. 
Uh, let funny. me ask you one more question, Lee, before we get too far. Um, Joshua has asked, uh, what do you do about storage when it comes to video? Very good question. Um, so let's talk about what's so like onset, and then we'll talk about offset. And then you uh, you call it when you need to bail because I know yep, you got we'll a do. hard stop. So so in terms of onset uh, storage, uh, so first of all, you know you record internally on the camera, um, and the faster cards you can get, the better. Um, I was very generously donated some ProGrade cards from ProGrade, um, and they've been really good. But what I actually capture onto is a thing like this. So this is a this is a, by another oh, Australian yes. company called Atomus. Um, and so they make monitor recorders. So this is a monitor that lets you do HDR and all sorts of lots of cool stuff. But the main feature that I use it for is actually, this is just a standard, well, not a standard, you can just get standard SSDs and you just slot it into there. And that instantly captures my footage into ProRes. Um, and ProRes is a video, think of ProRes, it's like JPEG or something like that, but it's, it's a format that was developed by Apple many, many years ago. And it's actually the standard now pretty much for video capture and editing because it's a really good compromise between file size and quality so it's there's different flavors but uh, you even get a raw version of it um but yeah so in terms of capturing on set this is generally what i'm capturing and storing my footage on um then in terms of where that footage is going um actually i'll just pick up my camera and we'll see how well it does it in the dark here but so that up there um, is a Seagate, that is a Seagate RAID with about 70 terabytes worth of storage. Um, and that's a promise RAID next to it with also 70 terabytes storage, which is backing up that one. And then I've got a bunch of Synologies, which are backing up those two. That's a tough one. That's so, a lot of, that's a lot of data. That's, I mean, but but here's the challenge. It's so like when I'm shooting 4K ProRes RAW, um, I'm producing maybe two to three terabytes per day. Yeah. On on on, on a really big project because I'll be shooting with multiple cameras. Um, so, look on the bright side, storage is cheap as chips, pun intended. Um, again, cheap is a relative term, and particularly when we're talking about video cheap is very much a relative term. I remember having a conversation a few years ago. Um, it was myself, another cinematographer and a photographer friend of ours and myself and the cinematographer were talking about the new um, tripod that had just come out from Miller. I now use Sacklers, but anyway, um, this new mini, like this lightweight um, video tripod that had come out from Miller. And I think it was only about $1,500 and the photographer almost fell off his chair. And I was like, well, for us, $1,500 for a tripod is actually pretty cheap. Um, so, and the justification, I mean, that's, I mean, like now the main try the, the, I've got two of the Sacklers and those are each about when you add in the heads, it's about four grand for the tripod and the head. And you might go like, how the heck can you spend four grand on a tripod? Um, the thing is I'm putting about 50 grand worth of camera stuff on that tripod. Um, I'm more than happy to spend four grand on the tripod. So my 50 grand of cameras don't fall on the ground. Um, they also have, you know, they, 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 they got buttons and they do really cool things, but it's also, yeah, that's how I justify it. Never Tell underestimate you. the the utility of a good tripod in my yeah. opinion. Oh, and tripods will last you 20, 30 years. So yeah, you know, so get a good so or a really right stuff or something that's not going to break that you can spare parts for that's stiff, that's reliable, well, that's stable. Well, photography right. ones, um, I really like the uh, three-legged thing ones. Mm-hmm. Um, they do loosen up a little bit, but these are all complete. So first of all, it's really easy to adjust. So just undo that and out they come. So really easy to telescope in and out and then close them or what have you. Um, on a lot of them, um, one of the legs will come off as a monopod. Yeah, I think this one is because it's got a little orange thing. Um, again, not cheap. I think these are sort of in the 300 to $500 range, depending on which one you're getting. But relatively speaking really for photography really light really strong i used these for many years before i started getting like serious into the video stuff and moved on to like the heavier video tripods um but yeah definitely if depending on what you do but but 
you know what? Look, I've 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 made all the mistakes of you know everyone says you know buy cheap, buy twice, and I've bought a lot of things twice. Mm. Yeah. And don't uh, underestimate the availability of you know parts and uh, being able to get something repaired or serviced as well. That's really important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, hey, Lee, questions? I know I know you got to go. So uh, I've got let's... five minutes. Okay. Uh, I, Kim I asked. Five minutes. Kim asked about uh, offsite storage for your data. So offsite storage, um, it's I should do it. I'm bad. I don't. Um, Backblaze is the one that I know a lot of people in my industry use. Um, they're pretty good. I really should. The upload speeds in Australia are just so slow that it'd take me like three years to upload my stuff. Um, but like if you've got a decent upload internet connection, I think Backblaze is like five bucks US and that lets you back up a, a computer in any hard drives that are plugged into it. Yep. I'd like to I'd like to see if they've got some small print that would say, no, dude, you, you've you've plugged a 70 terabyte hard drive into it. That doesn't count. Um, no, the CEO just just issued really? a uh, a letter. Well, it was an email to all of the customers, and he, he basically said, "Yeah, you can upload wherever you want. They will dude, allow I'm, you to seed the backup. Like if you want to send them a hard drive, I, I will sign up. Well, with shipping today, it'd be quicker for me to upload it. Uh, yep. But I'll, dude, I'll sign up today if that's the case." I'm I've using it. I like it too. Lineup. It's okay, great. Yeah. Well, there you go. Backblaze. Have a look at them. Yep. Yep. Um, any other questions? Um, uh, talking about B-roll, um, it seems to me that what B-roll really re lets you do, Lee, is establish context, right? Um, yes. In, in telling, in, in, you know, driving forth the narrative, right? Um, and yep. that's why you kind of emphasize you can't shoot enough too much B-roll. Well, it, I mean, this is this is an extreme, so like I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but a video without B-roll almost may as well be radio. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you may as well just put up a picture and have, have, have a voiceover sort of thing, because that's, you know, yeah. Yep. Um, now, just th there is some comments, they are correct. So with Backblaze, if your stuff is on a NAS, so for example, if it's on um, a Synology, that doesn't count, they won't. They won't do that. But like, so if you're using Synology or QNAP, I think each of them have got their own online backup things that you can that you can use. Yeah, yeah, there are some others, but um, if you got direct connected drives, Backblaze is pretty solid, and it's it all comes down to how fast your connection is. So mm. for upload, because they always they give you plenty of download, mm. but they screw you on the upload. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Any other questions? Anything that I sort of covered didn't entirely make sense. I, one with regards to that 180 rule, I thought was quite fast because I hadn't really thought about it. Like I, I did it without ever thinking because I just did it because I thought, oh, I can't see the, just looked weird about the two angles. Like it was yeah. just, I hadn't really thought about it. But now that you mentioned it, yeah. is, is there like, when it comes to that, like in terms of like when you're doing pans, does that actually set, like, because obviously if you're doing a, a pan, you can probably get away with a little bit more of a 180 shot. Have you actually any ideas on how to make that more realistic or more approachable? How, in what context are you doing a pan? Like what are you Interview, shooting? interviews. You're doing an interview? Yeah. Um, not really. I mean, like, so what, what you could do is, because generally I'll have the camera like almost like right, physically like right over the person's shoulder. Right. Um, and it depends on what kind of look you're going for. So in that instance, like I would just have a, a, a wide, a wide shot to the side, and I'd have my cameras in that shot. Um, you, you see this a lot on on like new like six, think about your typical sixty minutes interview. Where I mean, right. I love that when you get to see the setup. Um, yeah, yeah. Like you see the setup in the shot, and that's the thing. Like sometimes you spend so much time trying to hide your cameras and hide your things, and sometimes you just can't. And if you can't, I say lean into it. Like yeah, like, okay, cool. Like, yep, like yep, yep. put in put a light in there that you don't even need. Like just, 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 just so it looks like, oh, look how much gear they use. Fancy. Um, yeah, it like does actually. Yeah, I get your yeah, point. So, That's a good point. Yeah. Like, like, like sometimes if you can't hide the gear, over accentuate the fact that you can't look at all this gear. Um, mm. Like a lot of people have gotten like, I mean, I've even got a slider that's been sitting in the cupboard for two years um, that, you know, during the interview, it sort of goes from side to side. It just makes people seasick, I think. Mm. Um, so... <laughs> It sometimes like it and you can tell when you're watching a documentary like oh someone just got a new toy um because they use it way too much it's like drone shots for a while like now it's gotten a little bit better like it's not overdone but it used to be like for a couple of years it's like oh God, i'm so over drone shots um 
so yeah variety and and don't overdo anything and yeah like i don't think you need to like that third shot i would just go wide locked off don't know like if it's if it's something you're doing for yourself play with toys see what happens but generally when i'm doing client work i try not to over as much as i want to so i have to fight my natural instinct i try not to overcomplicate it because i'm just making trouble for myself yeah just it increases the editing time and com- yeah exactly oh look oh look for interviews definitely have a third camera if you can because the more options the better yeah. but you don't need to have the camera moving mm-hmm. okay cool thank you yeah good to know good stuff Good stuff, Lee. Anything else? Thank you very much. Done oh, good. Well, thank you very much, uh, folks. I, I really appreciate. It. I really hope that was beneficial. Um, and um, if yeah, if if, um, if anyone needs to get hold of me, I'm sure you you all know how to. And Troy will make make contact stuff available. So no, happy to always happy to nerd out. And um, yeah, everyone mm-hmm. have a have a lovely evening. Perfect. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. I appreciate you doing this. Um, no worries. For those of you, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but if you guys want to hang out for a little bit, we can chat and, you know, kind of visit for a bit. I know that, that uh, Lee's got a bail or bail. I think he, I think he, he already has. <laughs> yeah. He's he got to go. Left the room. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. He's got stuff going on. So, all right. So thank yeah. you guys. I'm going to stop the recording.